Wow, you guys really liked seeing me complain about Splatoon 3's current state. Guess I should become a part-time Splat-tuber for a bit. Anyway, the original Splatoon was kind of a miracle for Nintendo. Even though it released on the Wii U when the system reached life support, it was a widespread success, spawning a franchise that proved to be massively successful on Nintendo's next system. I sadly never got to play this game in its prime, as I got into the series midway through 2's life. By the time I got a copy of the first game, the third game had already released, so I haven't exactly played much of this game game compared to its sequels. Anyway, while the original has quite a few issues like the queue times, balancing, and friend interactions, a lot of people agree that there's one thing this game did better than either of its sequels the maps. Before attempts were made to simplify the maps, likely so they could work on every mode, Splatoon 1's maps are much more experimental and primarily made for Turf War, and as such, they tend to be far more unique and fun. Since the online servers for non-jailbroken Wii U's are going down soon, I decided to go through all these maps to see how they play today, before they all go away forever. Because I was in a bit of a hurry, and because I didn't want to subject myself to more waiting, I was only able to play so many matches on each map, and only on Turf War. As such, this ranking will be from the perspective of a filthy casual who would only play Turf War, though I may occasionally bring up some stuff I've seen from the ranked modes, because while there may be some high highs in this game's map roster, despite what Twitter may tell you, it is not a complete haven for perfect maps, because this game has quite a few stinkers. Of course, we have to get the worst ones out of the way first, so hold on your tentacles. <laughs> Port Mackerel is utterly pathetic. In a game full of open maps where you're free to take almost any route you want, Mackerel boxes you into these tight, claustrophobic corridors that would even make some of 3's maps seem open in comparison. You're barely given any room to move, especially with the low elevation, moving forklifts, and plethora of uninkable walls factored in. Gaining ground can be very annoying since an enemy could be hiding around any corner, or worse, on top of one of the boxes. This map isn't completely worthless since I like the side routes out of spawn that can lead to some helpful platforms, and the forklifts being inkable can help you gain some height. But aside from that, this is a claustrophobic and visually ugly mess of a map on Turf War alone, and I can't imagine it being too fun on the ranked modes either. Seriously, why are the zones so far apart and not even centered? It's not nearly as bad as some of the hell spawns to come from later games, but Port Mackerel is still a dull, boring map that sticks out like a sore thumb compared to most of this game's other maps. Where is Warehouse Mountain? Walleye Warehouse is a Splatoon 3 map that came two games early. I know these jokes are kind of outdated since 3's dev team finally learned basic map design, but still. Anyway, this map is very small and narrow, leading to a bunch of messy skirmishes in mid. It's very flat too, barring a few boxes spread across the map. Why didn't they keep the cranes carrying the boxes from the pre-release version? That would have given this map at least some charm. Though there are some flanks off to the side, they're extremely narrow and hard to use without getting killed, so you're probably better off going straight forward. Don't have much else to say about Walleye, aside from it being an ugly, frustrating mosh pit that really could have done with a rework. I don't blame Marie for burning her work uniform in the slightest. I get so tilted at the towers. Moray Towers has got to be the single most divisive map in the series. Half the community absolutely adores this map, while the other half utterly despises it. I stand firmly on the side of the haters with this one. Its two defining features, those being its tall height and its zigzag main path, are both detrimental to the overall map, with how long it takes to get to mid, and how few routes you can take outside mid. Mid itself is pretty small, and prone to awkward encounters. The extra elevation and lack of cover makes backline weapons such as chargers very oppressive and hard to deal with, given the limited approach options. Because there are so few ways to exit spawn, if one team locks the other into their spawn, they've basically instantly won. If you like this map, good for you, but to me, Moray Towers is a monotonous slog casually. And from what I've seen and heard, it's far worse in the ranked modes for different reasons. And to think this was the stage we got in Smash Brothers. Okay guys, did you finish setting up camp? Camp Triggerfish triggers me. I really like the setting as a wooden playground floating above a lake really fits with this game's youthful, summery tone, but presentation can only get a map so far. Triggerfish is designed around two long, narrow bridges that extend out from each team's base. Until the final minute when the gates drop, the only way to travel between the bridges is by going all the way around to the graded area and making a one-way drop. This is very tedious and makes flanking a Annoying. Even after the gates drop, you're still unable to switch between bridges in the middle of the map, which severely restricts your movement. The setting is good, like I said, and it can be fun to shoot people on the other bridge, but aside from that, Camp Triggerfish is just a mess for most of a match, and even late into one, it's still annoying. It's alright, Pearl. We don't always nail our first designs. Look! It's the Great Divide! Bluefin Depot is 
a weird map. Instead of leading into one big middle section, this map has two paths from spawn that each lead into separate middle platforms on either side from each other. Both platforms are very cramped, and you can't easily move between them on most modes. They're also just far enough apart from each other that only main weapons with very long range like the E leader can reach the other side. And good luck moving all the way around the map to take care of them. The region just above the two mids is fine enough, but the spawn region is way too high up and cramped, making the angles you can take out of spawn kind of limited. They recently brought this map back in 3 with a new coat of paint, and while I have issues with how it plays there, it has just enough new features and extra polish for me to call it the better version. A first for that game's remakes of Splatoon 1 maps. Only took him 15 months. You just got coconut mold. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about Arowana Mall in this game. For one, I'm very mixed in the aesthetics. I love the beachside background, but the castle brick textures on a lot of the walls look really out of place for an outdoor mall. It does make sense within the context of the lore, but it still looks really weird. This map could also fare a lot better in terms of gameplay. There's a good amount of inkable walls, but the map as a whole feels very narrow, and the minimal side routes don't help, encouraging a lot of brute force pushes over strategy, especially given how broken some of the special weapons in this game are. It's not nearly as bad as it could have been, but Arowana Mall is still a rather cramped map that really could have used some more work. One day, we'll get a mall map that doesn't feel like a hallway. One day. It's been McMissile! <laughs> Surrounding the discussion of the worst map in all of Splatoon, the map that seems to be given that title the most is Salt Spray Rig. And I must say, really? This is the worst map in the series? Don't get me wrong, from a competitive standpoint, I can absolutely see it. The map is mostly made up of narrow walkways that are hard to fight on, the spawn regions are way too cramped, one of the teams gets an unfair advantage due to the elevators, there's an entire northern platform with one route to that basically serves as little more than a lockout, I can go on. This map was so unpolished that it was banned from rotation on two of the three ranked modes, and I can easily see why. But at the same time, I don't know, man. Swimming around and jumping between the walkways, taking cover with the walls, swimming up the walls to surprise enemies, and standing on the crane to paint from above is so much fun. While not exactly the most well-designed map in the world, and it could certainly do with some heavy reworks if they bring it back in 3, Salt Spray Rig is a very fun map for how bonkers and off the wall it is. And I'll take it over torture chambers like Wahoo World and Mincemeat Metalworks any day of the week. Great. Just great. Kelp Dome is great. Not great as in very fun to play, great as in heavily reliant on greats. The greats and the ramps leading up to them are your main methods of getting around in this map. Should you choose to stay on the ground, you have to take the long way around into mid since there are next to no inkable walls. As such, this map has a ton of choke points that the enemy can lock you out of, forcing you to take another long way around the map. Thankfully, leaping over the ramps and shooting people from atop the greats can be fun. Mid itself can be fun to fight in as you can travel between the floor and and the greats instantaneously, leading to plenty of fun encounters. But with all that said, Kelp Dome, despite being very great, is far from great. Just saying, it would have been better if there were less walls and more open space. What a f***ing asshole. Hammerhead Bridge is my favorite straight line map in this game. Much like Kelp Dome, Hammerhead is heavily reliant on greats. But here, the greats feel much more in line with the setting since the bridge is under construction. Many of Hammerhead's greats are very wide and cover a lot of the map. You can use these greats to help you gain the advantage in battle, and it helps that there are just enough inkable walls to help you get up to them. It's risky since you are quite vulnerable standing on the greats, but it's well worth the risk. There are also various routes you can take out of spawn, as well as numerous positions you can snipe from. Sounds like it should be a top tier map, right? Well, it's still a straight line, and while it is wider than Walleye and Arowana with a lot of elevation, it can still feel a little narrow. It can also be pretty annoying to attack people on certain higher grounds, especially since the only real way into the enemy base is across the greats. If you don't have a brush, you're out of luck. Hammerhead Bridge is a really good map that falls short of being great due to a handful of movement restrictions. Oh well, I sure can't wait to see the improvements they make to it once they bring it back in Splatoon and three. You guys want to go skateboards? Black Belly Skate Park is the kind of map that feels like it could only really work in Splatoon. This game is about a bunch of delinquent teens skipping school to shoot each other with paint, so a skate park seems like a natural place for them to hang out. Being a skate park, Black Belly is full of ramps and half pipes, really setting it apart from other maps in the series. Despite the map's small size, there are various routes into and around mid, many of which are two-way paths, allowing for various routes you can use to attack and retreat. There's also a big tower right in the center of the map, which can be used as a lookout point for sniping. Overall, Black Belly Skate Park manages to be consistently chaotic with its fun theme and layout. Its small size and bumpy terrain can admittedly sometimes get in the way of my enjoyment, but it's still a fun map. Urchin Underpass. 
from Splatoon. Urchin Underpass was the de facto first map of this series. It was among the first maps to be shown off in the initial reveal trailer, it's the map seen on the cover art, and it even made its way into Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's battle mode. Yet they still didn't bring the actual map back for 2 or 3. Anyway, Urchin Underpass is pretty solid. It's far from perfect since the spawn region's a bit cramped and there are some occasional bumps in the terrain. Aside from that, most of the terrain here is great, especially the trench in mid with the two ramps you can jump between. There are numerous tunnels off to the side you can take to gain advantageous positions. It's really fun to use these to sneak around the map and ambush unsuspecting players. I don't really have much else to add to this entry. Urchin Underpass is simply a functional, fun map, exactly what the first map in a shooter game should be. Sure, it did need a rework to see its full potential, but it still did a great job at setting the standard that all future maps should follow. However, it isn't any higher because I personally find the top 5 to be more creative and fun. <laughs> Piranha. Piranha Pit is a rebellious map, as it decides to be wide rather than long. It also decided to litter itself with conveyor belts, which can propel players and defend the bases from enemies. Gaining speed from the conveyor belts is a lot of fun, and it can really intensify the action. The conveyor belts tending to go one way may seem like a hindrance, but thankfully, this map has a ton of side routes and inkable walls to help you get around. There are various elevated points for backline weapons, as well as a fair amount of cover from them. With so many ways to attack and get around, Piranha Pit manages to be a consistently fast-paced and fun experience. Experience. It's not perfect since the conveyor belts can sometimes get in the way of your movement, and I'm not exactly big on the aesthetics since the series has a ton of industrial maps of varying quality. Aside from those slight grievances, Piranha Pit is a ton of fun with a complex yet engaging layout and fast pace. Museum Delfoncino belongs in a museum for how fun it is. This map is defined by its large spinners, which are inkable on most sides and cover a lot of space. Since they move quite quickly, at least compared to their counterparts in 3, they're extremely useful for getting around, taking defensive positions to snipe from or offensive moves to flank enemies from behind. While the spinners are the glue that holds this map together, there are still various other fun aspects of it, like the middle section with a ton of ramps and elevation differences, as well as a unique route out of spawn that quickly sends you to mid. All in all, Museum Delfoncino is a ton of fun with its unique and constantly shifting layout. Now, if only Inkblot Art Academy lived up to its status. Anchovies. Why? Anchovy Games is an absolute delight. At first glance, it already boasts a plethora of inkable walls and flank routes, which alone open up so many different movement options. And that's before we even get into this map's main hook propeller lifts. For some reason, this is the only map in Splatoon 1 to feature any kind of single-player gimmick. Seriously, none of the other maps even have any ink rails or sponges, which most of 2's and 3's maps have. And this was the last new map to be added to this game. Don't know why it took them this long to implement single-player gimmicks in a multiplayer map, but I'm just glad they did. Using the propeller lifts to flank, gain elevation, and screw over other players is an absolute blast, especially in mid with how big its platforms are. Because of how varied the terrain in this map is, and how often parts of it move at the player's command, no two battles on Anchovy Games feel the same, and I looked forward to every chance I got to play this map. Wouldn't you know, the next map on the list also happens to feature shifting terrain. I think I'm sensing a pattern. A perfect day for a moisten. Mahi Mahi Resort is nothing short of a stroke of genius. It already has one of the best aesthetics in the game, as the colorful swimming pool by the resort fits perfectly with this game's vibe. And the aesthetic is just the tip of the iceberg. As soon as you spawn, you have so many different ways to reach mid. You could swing around the side islands, hop to the corner island, or go through the hallway that extends from your spawn. There are so many ways to get around this map, which already makes it a very fun island hopping endeavor. But then, Halfway through the match, the water drops. More land in mid becomes available, a few platforms rise, and there are various new routes you can take around the map. The moment the water drops is always the most hype part of a match here, since the entire layout drastically changes, which can really turn the tide of battle. Between its stylish presentation and chaotically dynamic gameplay, Mahi Mahi Resort is a map that's so easy to love. It's a fan favorite for a reason, and it's only topped by what might just be the best multiplayer map in the series. The one. The only. Flounder Heights. The absolute pinnacle of this series map design for many reasons. First, its scenery is stunning. The warm sunset over the suburbs gives this map such a cozy vibe, as if you're hanging out with your friends after school. This map truly feels alive, almost as if it's a real apartment complex where people live. Must be annoying for its residents since a bunch of squid kids keep fighting on the roofs and making a lot of noise. But I'll gloss over that, since the gameplay of this map is also top tier. The spawn regions offer so many ways to approach mid, as well as defend against incoming enemies. Even in and around mid, there are so many 
different paths to take. You could charge through the main buildings in mid, swim up either one to hold that zone, or flank from either side. Nearly all the walls in this map are inkable, making it extremely open to exploration and unique plays. This is the one map in the series that feels like an adventure to play on, with how big it feels and how many ways there are to traverse it, and I rarely have a bad time on it. The only slight nitpicks I have with it are that it can be a little narrow in certain areas, and the two towers in mid can be a bit annoying to climb for certain weapons. But apart from that, Flounder Heights is a masterclass in map design, and not a single other map in the series since has topped it. Well, that was Splatoon 1. I really wish I got to play this game in its prime, since it has so many unique qualities exclusive to it, and I'm sure 10-year-old me would have played the hell out of it. Even though the servers are on life support, which will soon be unplugged, I had a good time visiting this game one last time before it goes away. Even though I didn't play it much, I'm gonna miss it. It's such a charming, unique game, especially for the time, and it sucks that 90% of it will be unplayable for general audiences soon. I guess we have unofficial servers and the two sequels to somewhat fill that void, but the feeling that this game had when it was new will probably never be replicated. Though the series has gotten a lot bigger since, it's always a good idea to take a look back at where it all began.